Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Culture Binge, Wisecracks Culture Podcast, where we talk about everything going on in the zeitgeist. I am Michael. I'm joined today by Wisecrack writer Alec. Hey. And Wisecrack researcher Serby. Hi. How is everyone doing today? Well, great. How are you? Oh, I'm pretty great. I'm excited about everything we have on deck today. Um, and we ha- even have a special guest coming up. I'm not going to say who or what for just yet, because first I need to hear what has been both slapping and chapping in the lives of my esteemed co host since we were last together two weeks ago. So, uh, Serby, you want to get us started? Sure. So, so many things chapped this past uh, couple of weeks. I learned about a human trafficking trap that's going on at Target parking lots. My Target, Target parking, parking lots? lots? Target parking lots, yeah. So this is what happens. I'm going to do like a super abbreviated version because this is like a PSA for everybody, especially women. So what happens is if you're walking in the parking lot, another woman will come up to you and she will say, like, help me, help me, and act super distressed. You'll start to follow her. And what happens is that she has her car parked into the parking spot. Next to her, there will be a van that's parked outward. So they backed into the spot. And what will happen is she will open her driver's side door. So she blocks that exit. And then the guy in the van will open his driver's side door to block that exit. Somebody will open the van sliding door put you in, drug you, and then they'll take you off and human traffic you. Jesus Christ. This is a true what? story oh, wow. because my manager had this happen to her. She didn't get taken, ah! but she um, – I'm smiling just because I'm deeply uncomfortable and nervous about this. Yeah, I think um, we all are. Well, Burns she, isn't smiling, just me. Oh, I'm not she, smiling. Just so everyone listening knows, point. I'm not smiling. I'm very upset. <laughs> she, she got to the point where she was – almost in between the two cars when she was like when she saw the man in the car the man in the van and she thought to herself why did this woman run all the way across the parking lot to ask me for help when there's a man next to her so she stopped and she said what do you need help with and the woman was like um um i need help with um and she couldn't come up with an answer so then she turned around and like ran into the store and she called the police and the police came and said oh this is a you know very common human trafficking uh, tactic and they would have they would have put you in the van they would have gone on to the freeway and taken you down to Mexico what, what the fuck? fuck so I heard this back in August and I was like holy shit that's crazy then I was at Target my local Target that is like 10 minutes from my house and I'm with my best friend from high school and so we're talking and she's like she's getting weirded out because there's this woman in the parking lot just like standing there And so as we're walking back to her car, she's like, what is that woman doing? And I'm like, I don't know, maybe she's waiting for a ride or something. And then she starts to tell me that her mom heard a story about a woman approaching people in our Target parking lot for help. And there's another woman that was inside my Target um, following this. Her neighbor across the street has two young kids, three and five. The same woman on three different occasions went up to this woman and said, oh, your children are so good looking. They're so cute. They're so good looking. And like kept like eyeing them throughout the store. So you can't call people's I was kids like, good looking. You can say they're cute. But when I you know. say they're good looking. Ugh. I know. And so I was like, this is happening. Like it's not just that target that's happening in my oh, manager's God. area. This is happening in in my target, like five minutes from my house. It was so scary. <sighs> Well, okay, so that's what slaps for Serby, but what's bad? What cha- oh, I'm kidding. Uh, let's see. Do you have a slap that will balance out the depravity and depth of that chaps? No. I mean, I did watch Cheer on Netflix, which is a docuseries on that's cheerleading. Good. That was riveting. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good show. Great. So uh, if you're worried about <laughs> the horrors of sex trafficking and kidnapping in your local Target, watch Cheer. Alec. <laughs> What has been uh, slapping and chapping in your life? I also I'm I'm only gonna go for one chaps. Uh, all I have a lot. They all center around coronavirus. But I'm gonna start with slaps. Oh, also has to do with coronavirus. Not that coronavirus oh, slaps. But um, so I know I hate on a lot of brands uh, for trying to be cool on social media. Uh, but I'm gonna be positive this week. And what slaps is uh, 
there's something negative in here. I just had to sneak it in. Dumb websites are creating dumb DIY guides to hand sanitizer for fighting coronavirus that don't actually work. And I guess some of them included putting like uh, Tito's vodka, which is I think 40% alcohol by volume in it. And this is not the recommended strength of alcohol, according to the CDC. This isn't weird shit I saw on Facebook. This is the CDC website. Uh, so Tito's is going around replying to all the people who post these links saying that uh, th- this isn't strong enough. Can we, we actually have the tweet if we could show that? Or at least someone Dom tweeted about it. <laughs> yeah, they're just going around being like, please don't do this. This isn't this doesn't work. Trust science. Uh, so cool. Thanks, Tito's Vodka. <laughs> um, and then for what Chaps is uh, also related, people have been posting off stuff about hand washing and one poll uh, of British people. Uh, and I think we have that link in the description somewhere. We're, we're going to post it. Uh, but British people and their hand washing habits in the, the bathroom, uh, 21% of men, quote unquote, not always wash their hands after shitting while out after shitting. Oh, you got to not gotta always after the shit. What the fuck? Wow. Uh, and I don't want to avoid shaming women, but even though the men are substantially grosser because 13% of women do the same thing again, substantially less. These are the real monsters in society. Yeah. Well, I think we spend a lot of time scapegoating like bad mothers and just like mm-hmm. lots of groups that we shouldn't. But really, these are the monsters that lurk among us. Mm-hmm. What if it's a clean wipe, though? One of no, the ones where it's matter. so good that you wipe and there's nothing there. I call that, you know, it's like the perfect game. It's like the. the no. Are you one of shooting. these monsters? I'm not one of these monsters, I but I do think I do think like the same way a golfer hits a hole in one and that becomes a part of their narrative to do a perfect shit and wipe and there's nothing there it, it's really the body at peak performance and do I think, you think though that like even without shit there's not tons of bacteria on your butthole this is this is true oh but you know in general people i just wonder with genital uh hygiene it's the most protected part of the body you you wash it thoroughly in the morning and if you're an adult you should be scrubbing everything you you put a clean pair of underwear over it then a pair of pants over that I just feel like all the exposed parts of the body are significantly more disgusting. I've never put right, my but your your inner disgustingness, fussy. all of the like you know, if you have uh, certain like feces borne viruses or bacteria, you're gonna spread that to people. I do have questions about. I think everyone should wash their hands after they pee because pee is gross, but like pee doesn't really spread diseases like shit does. No. So even though I'm disgusted by it, I can at least be slightly more sympathetic. But also just like wash your hands a ton because. There's a pandemic going on. And so any excuse you can to kill germs, soap and water, you don't fucking need Purell all the time. Stop hoarding it. That's what's yeah. happening. Okay. And wait, and your slap. Oh, yeah, your slap was the tweet. Sorry. They kind of blended into one another. Yeah, so I wanted I'm to sorry. make sure there was a clear line of demarcation. Uh, I'll, I'll be quick with my, my chaps because it's similar. Uh, it's coronavirus. We talked about it on this podcast. Uh, the, the biggest thing I've hated about coronavirus, besides the fact that it's truly a pandemic that's hurting people and, and, and hitting uh, vulnerable populations, and it's very sad and scary, um, I think it's made all of us realize how much we touch our faces and how hard it is to not touch our faces. And that's been my struggle the past couple weeks is to be conscious of that and to adjust my habits. Um, and that's been rough. And I'm, I'm very scared about what's to come in the coming months, not to put panic in anyone's hearts. Um, but we'll see. I saw a post from a friend in Italy today where they've been quarantined for a while and he was urging all of us in this country to just like not do stuff, uh, not go to concerts or events or whatever, kind of just stay in and kick it. So so that's 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 chapping. What's slapping? I forgot about this fun thing you can do uh, in America and other places, which is if you have a long day, you can go buy a single beer from a store and ask for a small paper bag and, and walk home or just take a walk while drinking a beer. Uh, I recommend it. it doesn't I think work. it slaps. No. It doesn't, uh, the cops will stop you. The cops will not stop you. Okay. I mean, maybe well, it not you. On, it doesn't where you live. Uh, in Los Angeles, it's a spread out city, and you you can you can do something like that. In general, too, the reason for the paper bags is because cops don't want to like waste time with you on that. I think if you do live, let's say, in like a nice suburb outside of Dallas, you shouldn't do this because there's not a lot of pedestrian traffic, and the cops might be bored. In New York City, it will not protect you. You can't do it in New York, man. Bloomberg really messed things up for you all. That used to be a fun place with a lot of recklessness. 
and now it's all it also depends like who you are and like if the cops want to harass you like you know like in college i used to walk around chelsea you know smoking certain drugs they wouldn't bother me people who don't look like me they might bother he means meth Mm. um well that's fair (laughs) well I'll, i'll say this then if you if you are in a position in your life or your city or where you live to safely do something like that, it is kind of enjoyable and feels transgressive in a small way. If you are in a city where that's harder, then I would just say get a coffee tumbler and either make a cocktail in it, or if you want to be really safe, make a coffee-based cocktail. I'd suggest uh, yeah, get cold that's, brew, that's put fair. the cold brew over ice, add a little bit of Bailey's, some Jameson. Uh, shake that up, add a little bit of sweetener if you need to, but you shouldn't because of the Baileys. You're, you have a cocktail, you have coffee, and if anyone asks, it's going to look like coffee in that cup. So that's my modified version of my, my slapping activity for this week. Is that okay, Alec? Yeah, I mean, I've done stuff like that. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, well, we have a, a hell of a show, if I can say so myself. Uh, we're going to talk about buying houses with your friends. It's really exciting. Uh, we're going to have a special guest on. I'm going to just I'm going to not say who it is until it happens to talk to us about their dating diaries and what it's been like to be on the market in this digital age. But to get started, I wanted to talk a little bit about the dating dystopia that I experienced while binge watching the Netflix show Love is Blind. Um, if either of you watched any of this show, just so I have a context for who I'm talking to. Yes, obsessed. I okay, you watch. Did you watch the whole show, Serby? Yes. Okay, great. This is exciting. Um, and just for anyone who's listening who hasn't watched this, if you haven't, I would probably say you shouldn't. But uh, the <laughs> premise of the show is they took a bunch of people, I think fifteen men, fifteen women, all all heterosexual couples, put them in this warehouse environment with no windows, and every day they would meet in these pods for conversations. Now the just the the key is there is a dividing wall between them, so the men and women were not able to see each other. So they had lengthy conversations and without seeing each other physically many of these couples ended up getting engaged once they were engaged they were allowed to leave the pods meet each other they then went on a little honeymoonish trip to mexico to explore the relationship then they went back to atlanta where they lived in a really kind of corporate looking apartment complex together for a week or two and then the final step of this was they planned an actual wedding with their real families and friends and no one knew who was going to say what until they were at the altar so oh and it was hosted by a uh, nick and vanessa lachey uh, nick lachey of 98 degrees fame who multiple times in the show said and i'm obviously nick lachey as if anyone knows who you are that wasn't born in the 80s but um the the, the show frames itself as a grand experiment, and in the early episodes especially, and it does kind of reek of the fact that when they were making the show, they didn't know what it was going to be called yet, because they rarely say love is blind in the show, so it seems like a very slapdash production. But they keep saying, you know, in this grand love experiment, we will find out, is love truly blind? So it gives you this framing of being a show that's offering some sort of sociological or scientific experiment into the nature of love, and if love truly is blind. And what they're really doing is a sort of mind-body experiment. If we can separate the mind from the body and have two minds that are wholly rational and detached from physicality talking to each other, can, can we really find love in this way? Now, I think that involves, and I'm sure the producers didn't finish their undergraduate philosophy courses. Uh, But I think the premise of the show involves a misreading of Descartes, in which uh, we think that the body can be separated from the mind. Of course, Descartes even reminds us the two things are interrelated and speak to one another. The, The body is just the dumb version of the mind. But one of the most interesting thing that happens early on the show, at least something I found interesting, Serbia can speak to this later, is that the men, most of whom, and no offense to to, to all my gym bros out there, uh, were just like very stereotypical like gym guys. They were all very jacked. They all had like yeah. a short cropped haircut. They all had stubble. They all had jobs that were like marketing or or, or, or personal trainer or something. Go ahead. So wait, they did this whole show and didn't even put any like ugly people with hot voices. Mm. Yes, and this is the thing I was going to get to, but we can just say this now. <laughs> of course, part of the grand experiment was They were all relatively hot uh, by conventional standards. The biggest misdirect is like one guy was like kind of short. Not even that. Come on. And like, once again, shouts to my short kings, no disrespect. Um, (laughs) But but there was like a short guy, and then there was like some people of of color. um, And they they tried to like get a lot out of that, but there wasn't really any big surprise to be had 
no matter what, you were going to end up meeting someone who, by conventional standards, was at least rel- not even relatively pretty attractive. So yes. Mm. Um, but one of the weird things I noticed watching this show was how emotional the men got when they were detached from physicality. And, and by emotional, I mean every man on this show broke down in tears um, when proposing to the, the woman of their choice in a way that seemed very shocking considering these were like gym bros. Um, now, the thing that happened, though, is, of course, as soon as physicality was brought back into it, these men's personalities changed completely. Uh, they became aggressive, possessive, jealous, insecure, emotionally detached, all these sorts of things. So if, if we're going to say the show says anything smart or has any interesting cultural commentary, I, I think it got at maybe like male fragility a little bit and what happens when uh, a, a man is put in like a quote unquote safe space. Uh, and is detached from physicality. Uh, overall, though, I feel like the show is, it, it made me feel very gross. Like, by the end of it, I, I felt bad. I couldn't stop watching it, but I felt unclean. Uh, it really feels like their experiment, I mean, honestly, the, the Stanford prison experiment makes me feel better than the experiment <laughs> that goes on in this show. And their version of science truly feels like phrenology or something like that, the level at which they're getting into the experiment. Now, I want to give a few quotes from some of what's been written about this show. There was a Guardian review that's a pretty fantastic read that opens with, um, in many ways, and this is a quote, it is the final blow to the final nail in the coffin of civilization and possibly humanity as we know it. Uh, that's what? a description of this show. Um, now, the, at the end of the same article, uh, the author says, Anyway, Love is Blind is absurd, revolting, endearing, toxic, and wholesome by terms, and addictive as hell throughout. Uh, it's a very fair review because it gets at the fact that at in in an intellectual level, the show is disgusting, but you cannot stop watching it, which is why I'm telling you right now, if you don't have time, don't start. Uh, the New Yorker <laughs> uh, had an interesting piece about it. Um, and the, the title of the New Yorker piece was Love is Blind is Offensive to Human Dignity, which is key to its <laughs> success. Um, and this piece says that love is blind is morally offensive to human dignity is key to its artistic success. One sees the clear potential to build build it into a significant franchise. I'm imagining future seasons and a Black Mirror crossover episode and an expansion of the formula into a speed dating service whereby single people dating blind grope for meaning in the darkness. <laughs> um, so I, this show has inspired some some takes that are, are basically implying um, that it's a dystopian experiment in dating in the veil of trying to do something progressive and scientific it ends up creating a sort of hellscape and, and i think the I'll, I'll stop i'll say this and then we can talk about it but i think the promise of this show seems to be that like devoid of social media and our shallow culture people can find true love um but it doesn't work if the people in this experiment are already so infected by our culture to begin with Mm. Uh, it makes me think of the idea, not to get too uh, political here, but the, the, this thought that there's kind of no outside to capitalism, no outside to the system of marketization that we currently live in. Just in the same way, there's no outside to our dating culture. You can't take people whose entire uh, dating world, and we'll get into this later, takes place on Tinder and digital apps and involves the complete uh, fetishization of appearance and magically put them in a room and have that go away. Um, and I guess I won't spoil the show. I will say that that some people do actually get married through the whole process. I'll say that, that we have actual marriages and at the end they have a reunion special that tells us the show was filmed a year ago and some of these people are actually married. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so, so, I mean, maybe Serbi, or though Alec, if you're jumping into the bit, please talk. I'm curious what Serbi thinks as oh, no, the other Serbi. person who Serbi put herself through So this. I want to hear what she has to say. So I agree with you. I, I hated it, but I loved it. I even <laughs> took um, Friday off of work last week to watch it ah! because I started watching it on Thursday night yep. and then Friday morning I was like mm, my first call doesn't start till like 11 like I could yeah. do a, I could do a show and then oh, I we, just we, yeah we stayed up till like 3 a.m. on a work night in my house to finish watching it because we couldn't so I relate to this yeah and so I couldn't stop watching it and I also was um interested in the fact that the men were so vulnerable and open even when talking about something as simple as their favorite book from childhood oh there was God, a man yes. who broke down and i was like what like how did this happen um and then the other thing that i thought was interesting was they people kept saying things like like when they went from 
the they went from like the shared house to the vacation in Mexico and then they went to living together in the apartments the one thing they kept saying was how is this going to be we're going to have our phones and we're going to have social media again how is that going mm-hmm. to affect us and that was baffling to me that they were concerned about their relationship in the face of social media. And nobody even knew the two of them were together, so it's not like they were concerned about public scrutiny. They were just concerned about the fact that they had to talk to their family and friends and they would have access to Instagram again. Yeah, and one woman got, yeah, one woman gets screamed at by her partner because like she was Instagramming and not texting him back. And we see a fight about this that takes place in the gym, of course. Yeah, Uh, and he's like, oh, you're always on your phone. And she's like, that's my job, is to be on my phone. (laughs) Like, what are you saying? Yeah. So go ahead, Alec. No, no, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought that was just interesting that like that was the thing that was most concerning to them. Not the fact that, oh, we had only met two weeks before. It was Mm -hmm. how are we going to be in social media? Yeah. Uh, Someone brought this up. Michael, maybe it was you. Maybe it was Amanda, one of our writers. Netflix is trying to essentially make all these reality shows that are tapped into like black mirror dystopia what's the other one that we talked about the uh, the, the circle which is a a a big brother style reality show i haven't watched it but uh it seems like they're trying to do something smart but it sounds very dumb like, like it would have been at least int- maybe not interesting because i think we would have all seen it coming but like they could have asked hard questions like what if like every single dude was like just all of the objective, like not objective, sorry, all the sort of like stereotypical ideals of like beauty, just like the opposite of that, like you know, scrawny, short, yeah, whatever you need to do, um, and, and similarly like with the women, or like pair people together specifically, like if there is a guy who's like, I only date tall chicks, like get him like a really short girl, and if a girl's like, I only date short dudes, like get him, uh, you know what I'm saying? Essentially, yeah. like fuck with them in that way, but it didn't do any of that to really expose how we're all. Not we're all. These people, a lot of people are shallow monsters is what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah. Maybe that's too predictable, but I don't know. I'm skeptical of the whole thing as I think we all are. Yeah, and I think like Serbi's example about the couple that, that literally sheds tears, and I forget the exact book, but just like talking about how they read the same kids book. And honestly, like if you're of a certain age, there was five kids books. We all read the same ones. Um, but the depth of the conversation is shockingly shallow throughout. And once again, maybe there was things the producers left on the cutting room floor, but the deepest conversation we saw is a couple that had a fight about politics in which he said, but are you ever going to change your mind on politics? And she says, my beliefs are my beliefs. They're important to me. And he said, but they're not flexible. And she said, no. And then they made out across a, a table in a restaurant, which would have deeply upset me. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, I think, there's, there's an opposite version of this show, or maybe a, a modification I would like to see that was called something like Stat Sheet, where people were matched up based on like their actual beliefs and ideas and adult books they've read or something like that. I think that'd be interesting to match people up uh, with, with in-depth cool. things, but with people who maybe they wouldn't traditionally be attracted to. But all these, like none of these people, and, I don't, and some of them seemed like they were kind of genuine, but... I don't want to be mean. We all know what I'm getting at. I think it was interesting that even... So there was this one woman who who was attracted to the short guy. He wasn't short. I'm just calling him the short guy. Yeah. Um, But she was initially attracted to a different guy. And she would go on and on about how he's the typical guy she would go out with, even though she had never seen him. So when she finally meets the shorter guy and she sees the original guy together, she continues to pursue the original guy. And I thought that it was interesting that you're you're attracted to what you're used to and what you know. Mm-hmm. So even though this guy might have been the stronger pairing for her based off of her values and what she wanted, she she couldn't accept it. And she wouldn't allow herself to fall in love with him. She still wanted the other guy. Yeah, yeah and even one of the other couples, um, I guess I won't say names in case people want to. But there's another couple that gets together, and they're both really sweet, but like they won't have sex or be intimate with each other. Oh, yeah. And as it slowly reveals, one of the partners in that couple is like, I, I love them just as like a friend. Uh, mm-hmm. So you have these people that are like going to their actual wedding with their actual families there who can't be intimate with each other because they're truly not attracted to each other. Um, Wait, so, but they still get married? 
I don't want to reveal anything. All I'll say is some couples get married. We do get to see in the show, and this isn't spoiling anything, couples at the altar with their families there who when asked, do you take this person? They say, no, nah, I'm good. And it gets a little awkward. Yeah. That and that's one concocted. of the things I think is the most reckless. Not to be all like that I'm someone that, that cares too much about the sanctity of marriage. Like, whatever, do you. But it's kind of fucked up to be in this scenario where you have like your aging parents there and childhood friends and family members for this thing that it, it does make a mockery of, of the institution of marriage and the idea of lifelong monogamy. So it's it's not the best in that sense. I mean, and it's upsetting yeah. too because they, they brought the families together. Like in a lot, mm-hmm. some of these situations, the families met each other. So it's like you're just going to say no at the altar after you've already gotten to know their family. I find that very upsetting. Yeah. Well, uh, I, we should we should move on because we're, we're staying in a similar realm. But I will ask this of everyone here, and this is the question that Nick and Vanessa Lachey ask all of the participants in the show at the reunion special. Start with you, Alec. Is love blind? Uh, pass. <laughs> Serby, is love blind? So I'm not, I'm, I've never really gone out with a guy according to his looks. So for me, I'm not interested in that sort wow. of thing. I mean, wow. I, I, they're attract, people are attractive to me if they're like kind and funny and things like that. And then I find them physically attractive. So to me, love is blind. Wow, I really love that response, and I do think it was the correct <coughs> one. I'm not going to say anyone had an incorrect answer, but Alex. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say I'm going to say halfway. I think that if you're someone who values uh, the the intellect and kindness and some of the things that Serby just talked about, I do think love can be blind. I do think if you're an adult that works in marketing and your favorite book is still a children's book, uh, and you spend most of your time at the gym, anyways. It might be the case that love isn't blind and you just want a hot bod to kick it with. And I don't judge that. I like it when like hot people that like working out and chilling get together. Why not? Why not? But I don't think love is blind. Now, we have a guest here today for our next segment. Uh, you might have heard of him. Uh, you probably have. We have Jared here with us today. Hey, what's up, guys? Yeah. Good to be back. Ooh. Yeah, the sort of Don Corleone of the Wisecrack crime family. And <laughs> he's here to talk to us about his recent experiences in dating. Well, the interesting thing is that two of the people here have been in relationships so long that they've never had to experience online dating. And yeah. that would be Michael and Alec. And so I decided that now that I'm back on the online dating game, I would subject myself to their questions and tell you a little bit about the misery that is online dating. Wow. Yeah. and. Uh, you know, Jared complains to me about his life often. Not, not a, just everything. You know, <laughs> <the bugs. laughs> um, it's part of Alex's job. In his job description, it says, "Here, Jared commiserate." <laughs> yeah, and I always love when uh, Jared complains uh, in very <laughs> philosophical ways about things that are not necessarily philosophical. Um, so, one, th- I think the two things I want to talk to Jared about are finding or like determining having an existential crisis when making your online dating profile uh as as jared is currently having and the second one uh is jared was on a a date that did not go well but somehow it (laughs) spiraled into a conversation about bullshit jobs and how people conflate their careers with their identity um yeah all right we'll we'll go one at a time yeah i i want to start with uh jared what are some of the what are some of the struggles and sort of uh, deep existential questions? Well, first of all, what is building a profile even like for you? Building an online profile is like a dating profile is akin to staring straight into the abyss of your own oh identity. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, of course, you have to ask yourself, who am I? What am I good at? What do I like? All these questions that the dating app assumes are easy to answer questions. And even, you know, maybe normal people would say those are easy to answer questions. But I've always, you know, someone like me, I've always had a bit of an identity crisis where I'm pulled between these two very different identities. There's like very much like a type A part of me. And then there's very much a type B kind of like lazy media obsessed kind Mm -hmm. of I'm down to just watch movies all weekend kind of guy. And so the question is always, well, how do, what do I say? Do I say that I'm both of these things? Do I say that I'm one of these things? And it's actually quite sad when you test these things because previously 
I had done the douchey thing and optimized my profile to, pre to present myself how you would think someone would want to mm. see you. So, you know, I would say like, oh, I started this business. Uh, I'm really driven, blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, you emphasize <laughs> I'm the an things. entrepreneur, god damn it. <laughs> yeah, I'm an entrepreneur, god damn it. And then you emphasize the things that you do maybe like once every two months, like hiking, yeah. traveling, all the stuff that you think people want to hear. And unfortunately, in my experience, those are the things that get the responses. And so I have this old dating profile that I reactivated and it had my old info on there and that one seems to be doing well but then since then there are since i've been in you know I was, I was in a relationship for like almost three years and then since that ended there have been a lot of new dating apps that have come up so i just joined some of those and i started to create a new profile and i asked myself you know I learned a lot in this last relationship, and I'm going to present myself in a way that I think is more accurate, or I've learned more about myself, or I've learned more about what it's like to be in a relationship. And so I definitely emphasize this type B element of me, the kind of person who's like, if you want to go see Lohengrin at the LA Opera while really high, we're going to get along. Huh? And that person is getting no love. Wow. On Wait, can media. I ask um, yeah. how many individual apps that you are currently presenting yourself on? I'm only on three, but okay. I've downloaded like six. And seriously, the the challenge of creating a profile is so painful that I've downloaded the apps, but stopped short of creating the profile because, wow. of course, then there's choosing the pictures, being completely blind to which pictures look good or look accurate or how long is too long before you need to take a new picture. Is mm -hmm. a two-year-old picture too old? Yes. It is? What do you think is the, the right? I, I think I think you should have your main pictures be within the past six months. And I think that a majority probably, of your pictures wow. should be in the past 12 to 18. Uh, I feel I like a lot of people, now. though, stay pretty static for, like, oh, I yeah. look, I think I look the same as I do two years ago. But I think we all for, think that. We all think that. Yeah. I, I mean, I really, it's how far has my hairline team. gone back? <laughs> yeah, cry me a fucking river. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Michael. We love you and your hair. Or There's also hair. this element of the algorithm that kind of places it, it, it. Some of these apps will place you in this algorithmic thing where you now understand your level of attractiveness from this seemingly objective standpoint, and that can be horrifying. That's staring straight into the abyss because maybe it's an algorithm, maybe it's math doing something magical to- Oh, I've actually... heard about this algorithm, and I think it's very similar. Uh, in academia, maybe Burns knows a little bit more about this, there's an impact score where like, if you're cited a lot of times, it means you're important, but if the people citing you are cited a bunch of t times, that means you're even more important, right? Like if the hot shit, philosopher cites you in a paper therefore you're also hot shit and that's kind of what um google rankings were based off of originally um but i think it happens where if someone like likes your profile or swipes right or whatever uh and they also have a high swipe rate the algorithm's like oh jared's hot shit you know we're gonna we're gonna show him to all the like hot people uh which is horrifying <laughs> it's just another way of measuring your self-worth in a way that is potentially horrifying. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, like, what are the n number averages for this? And by that, I mean, for how many people you contact, how many contact back, and then from how many you are in contact with, does it lead to an actual date, roughly speaking? Well, back then, so it, now every dating app is basically Tinder. Back okay. in the day, you would be able to message somebody blindly whether or not they're interested in you, but these days it's all about swiping. There are subtle variations in various apps, but it's all about swiping. If you get connected, then you, you know you get to message that person. In terms of numbers, I would say even if you get connected, it's like a 50% chance that they'll respond mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And so you ask yourself then, it's like, okay, well, why did this person swipe right in the first place? Is it because maybe my first picture looked good, but my rest of my pictures didn't look good? Or maybe they didn't read my profile, and then once they read it, they're uninterested? It's just really kind of soul soul mm -hmm. soul crushing in a lot of ways. I swiped right on you when I was on <laughs> the dating app. I saw I, you and I, I was like, "Oh my god, he looks so hot." Well, I swiped. I swiped. Is that right. real? That's real. Yeah, we swiped right She's on each other. Oh, I yeah. love it. That's so good. Years ago. 
Wow. Yeah, I sent him a few flirty messages. They went unanswered. Damn. Wow. That's because I texted Someone you out. on the phone. Idiot. Idiot. Oh, we did text. Yeah. Because I had her number, so wow. I figured that, you know, I wanted to text you back without giving away any data, Serby. Wow. <laughs> and to let all the <laughs> listeners know, they are not currently in the same room right now, so the tension isn't palatable. No, it's not. Um, so that's good for me. Uh, wait, so I have a question. Do you think, and this is more of a theoretical thing, I'm kind of obsessed with this, and I wish... I once said to my partner, I wish I could online date as an experiment because I've never really gotten to like live in this Oh, I've said that to my partner. Yeah. <laughs> and you slept on the couch for a weekend or... <laughs> no, she's um, just like, uh, whatever. Like, <laughs> but, but I, my theory would be that I feel like most people probably put their best picture as their main picture. My theory would be I'm going my second or third best picture for my main picture. Then when you like swipe me and you go to my profile, the next picture you see is going to be my best one. So you're you're liking me on what's like solid. That's a power move. Yeah, because then when you get into it, you're not like, oh, he doesn't really look like that. You're like, oh shit. Um, he actually looks better. Yeah, and I, I what that would probably decrease your first level numbers of like initial swipes, right? But would you rather get the one picture swipes or less of those? But then when people get involved, they see more. I'm I'm speculating because I've never been on these apps. That would be my theory. So some of these apps have almost like freemium mobile games they have incentives to keep logging in every oh, day boy. they even have you know e economy like so for example the app that serby and i swiped each other on oh, was yeah. on coffee meets bagel where they actually have uh coffee beans which are things that you can accumulate and spend to open up messages with certain people or whatever but because it keeps on getting you back to log in and then every time you log in and you don't see that number of notifications that you would want to see, you're always saying, oh, oh should I be optimizing it a little more? Should I be changing that photo? So I have similarly come up with these game plans of saying, yeah, I'm going to do one picture that's maybe a little less flattering just so that I attract the most honest people. But you know, after a couple of days where that stops working or doesn't work at all, you start saying to yourself, shit, maybe I'm just completely wrong. And so you just, because you're logging in every day and expecting something every day, you end up kind of just driving yourself crazy, thinking, I, I how do I optimize this? And at what point is optimizing creating this other digital self? I mean, ever since, I don't know if maybe you guys had the same experience, but ever since talking on the internet was a thing with like AOL instant messenger just showed my age. It, there was always this d division between my real life self and how I can speak to somebody in the digital world. And I feel like that's put on steroids in the dating game in a way mm -hmm. that, you know, maybe you're better at telling jokes when you're on AOL instant messenger or through text or whatever, but <sighs> the way that you have to present yourself holistically as this is what I look like physically. These are why I'm an attractive person. This is why I'm worthwhile as a human being is just all the more frustrating and yeah, just potentially really soul crushing. Wow. I also imagine there's a double-edged sword in that, not that you would ever describe yourself this way, but you could put in your bio like, I'm a media executive or something. And in LA, I'm sure lots of people would really like that, but the people who swiped on you for that reason would probably be awful whereas like if you put i'm a writer well i think you also identify as that those people might be a little bit cooler okay. yeah it's tough go here's ahead. the thing serby go ahead you need to put your best picture as your first picture because <laughs> i just said love is blind but when i was using th those apps i s found myself becoming more shallow mm. and when you're just faced with an endless number of men it's like no 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 so your first picture has to be really nice your profile can't say things like especially here in la it can't say things like i'm a writer i'm a media executive everybody's a writer everybody's a media executive everybody's yeah. a model yeah it doesn't mean anything Those, it doesn't mean anything it's not interesting you're better off saying things like i like these kinds of movies or this is my favorite band or on the weekends i enjoy walking my dog, like things like that, that give me a glimpse into what you like to do. Jared, can we do a social experiment and just do a Nicolas Cage themed profile and just, just, just do it for a week <laughs> or two and then see, maybe you'll get a cool date with someone who's really into watching Vampires Kiss and Mandy. 
You don't no. think that would work? No, I think it's a horrible idea. It's a great think, idea. You should. I think up. it makes you look like you're someone who's going to murder someone. <laughs> that you're going to be like, oh, it's this coffee shop. Here's the address. And they look it up on Google Maps and it just shows like a warehouse. And you're like, no, no, it's like new. And then it becomes like a thing that Serby talked about earlier in the Target no, parking but this, lot. No, but to Serby's point, even, I mean, from a male perspective too, maybe even especially, it really does train you to be shallow because there are so yeah. many people that it's presenting you with at all times. People who live, and in LA, maybe this isn't a, uh, something that's different but since LA is so big you know you'll be getting people from Long Beach and it's like 30 miles away it's like, uh, you know I'm not going to drive to Long Beach it's so international relationship. you're getting so many yeah basically you're getting so many people that it just trains you to just say all right well if I'm not physically attracted to this person then it's probably not going to go too much farther I mean the, the the problem is is that a telephone is very much, at least in the way that it's being used here, a visual medium. And so the visual is always going to be the most important part. And, you know, so I think that your strategy of putting your best picture third or fourth, you would probably change that after being, like, disappointed after a while and feeling and just watching yourself fall in that algorithm of attractiveness and then that's just it's just a kind of a gross thing to even think about well here's the question for serbian and jared is is this all there is now is if you are if you are dating in this world is do people even consider the opportunity of organically meeting someone out and about or is this it i'll be honest no you go ahead well, this was a couple of years ago, but I have asked girls out on the street, like not just, you know, like after a conversation, yeah, but, yeah. Um, you know, usually because I'm with my, I have my dog. If they yeah. have a dog, usually that starts up a conversation. I'll usually wait till the third or fourth time that I run into them and they don't like it or maybe they just don't like me. I mean, that's also a possibility, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> but I don't know. Yeah, I've had people tell me that asking and i've had people say like oh my god you asked someone out on the street what are you a psycho yeah and i always thought that that was kind of a ballsy romantic move but i don't know really it's maybe a better question for serby so i i'm torn part of me likes that idea i would like i prefer to meet somebody organically um but when i have been so i don't get asked out ever but the one time i did get asked out like just i think i was shopping at trader joe's it it made me nervous Um, not because I thought that the guy was like a killer or anything, but just, I started to think like, I don't know anything about him. I don't know who he is, Mm. what his name is or anything. Like I can't go out with him. Like what if he kills me or kidnaps me or something? And so I said no, but had we met like through a friend or at work or through something else, I would have said yes. So I I didn't want to like like, blow your spot up here, but Serby told us this before that man was Chris Evans. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And she could have, been with him and she chose not to sorry to blow up your spot but no what, wait, so what did he though. what did he say um we were talking about um so i was i was getting bread gluten-free bread and so he he asked me a question about it and so we started talking and then um obviously i opened up with all my food allergies which is really attractive <laughs> um oh, and that. then he just sort of said something like oh well would you like to go out to um there's he said there's a an allergen free bakery that he knows of and if i wanted to go and like get something with him and i was like oh that's so okay. nice but yeah. i was like oh no i can't do that because i don't know you and i'm afraid and yeah. i don't know i got scared i i did i used to work uh with somebody they like kept a spreadsheet of like i think they had something like a thousand messages like 50 replies only like five dates uh they had been married at this point for, I think, over five years, maybe 10, uh, had uh, a child together. He met her in line to get a bagel, like just at the coffee, at the, the bagel line, just being like, hey, and started chatting and is now happily married to that person. Um, I, I mean, I met yeah, my fiance I, I, in a coffee shop. So is that true? Yeah. We're just sitting next to each other in a coffee shop but, and ended up casually but chatting. what year? Uh, this would have been. Wait, so we're 2013. So 2013, that's when the dating there apps started apps. being yeah. mainstream. Like I, I had downloaded Tinder because someone told me about it right before I met my fiance, and I had, I had an account on um, OkCupid, I think, at one yeah, point, that but that was not like ones. an app. But you have to write like an essay about yourself. But yeah, because I remember in 2010, 2011, there was still a big stigma against them. 
And uh, yeah. I even once tried the Craigslist personal section just because I was like, fuck it, you know, what, whatever, yeah. see what happens. That did not go well. But no perhaps shit. that's a story for another time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, well, before before we move on, which sadly we have to, does Alex Derby, any, any last probing questions for Jared while he's on this romantic digital journey? I think we have to ask you about your bad date for another time, which oh. I think I think people will want because we are running out of time. But I do want to have Jared on here regularly. And I mean, Serby's on here anyway, but I'm fascinated by this world and all the existential questions that come up. Maybe it's just as a weird. Well, I got a question for Serby. Yeah. W- what you are you just hoping to meet some guy in real life now? What are you a Neanderthal? <laughs> yeah, I, know. I I just recently got out of a relationship, so I I'm very I'm very much still in love with that guy. So I don't think oh. I'll be dating anytime soon. But when I if I do feel ready to date, I real. I would hope to meet somebody that like somebody can introduce me to, just because I apparently just clam up and get really nervous when somebody approaches me in public because I get scared. Wow. Yeah. So I will say for any women that are listening, Jared is a catch. <laughs> absolutely date him he's so hot in person really smart really funny very kind and i would love and, to help you with yeah. your dating profile and he's, he's and taller like, than I, you'd I, think and I, I feel like women do stereotypically like tall men and i'm constantly shocked day in day out that jared is always taller than i think he is it's like he's growing <laughs> every day i thought he was short before i met him in person and then yeah. i show up to la and he's fucking almost as tall as me i'm like what the fuck well alec alec is a giant I'll, I'll say this oh, really both, i thought jared you were and sure. alec Are yeah they both tall? look no. like they could yeah fight. no alec is taller I, than me yeah i'm six foot four and i'm dating someone who's five feet five foot one <laughs> Wow, it's like a like a Shaq and Cookie situation. No, what was her name? I think Shaq's first wife, her name was Cookie or something. She was five one, uh, but that's an that's my topic for next time. Uh, well, yep. we do have to move on from this because we we got a lot of show ahead of us. But Jared, thank you for no. burying your soul in this oh, way. Oh yeah, the, the no, vulnerability here is attractive and impressive. Oh, thank you. I yeah. hope that it was insightful and not just sad. Yes, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and then well, I'm going to talk about. about this before we end too. But just right now, while it's in everyone's mind, if you want to share your thoughts opinions and stories from the struggles of online dating you can also always hit us up uh culture at wisecrack.co and we'll give you the number later but right now what we have to do is get into our final topic of the day everything today has to do with intimacy at some level so now we're going to get into a platonic cohabitation serby tell us about home buying with friends yes okay so there was a recent article in the atlantic about two couples that recently purchased a home together. Their philosophy is that life is better living in a community of friends. And so they share everything from the mortgage to their cell phone plan, grocery bills, and dinner, I think, every night. And I started to think about this idea of living with friends and buying property together. And this living arrangement wouldn't work for me, mostly just because I'm very intensely private but also i i'm not i have a lot of acquaintances and like a handful of really close friends and even though those friendships are quite intimate and close they're not at that level where i would feel comfortable wanting to live with them and buying buy a home with them and i also don't want to feel like i'm back in college living with roommates and then i came to the part of the article in which one of the men says something like He was going through a career and a financial crisis, and it was nice to have other people other than his wife to depend on and to listen to his problems. And so I started to think about this more broadly. And I do think that there is something nice about wanting to build a community at home and to have a larger support network and people to rely on in order to combat isolation or to feel more engaged with others. So while this living arrangement wouldn't work for me, I can see the benefits and I want to have a two-part discussion about this. I know we're running out of time, but just very quickly, I want to know, would you be interested in buying a home and living with your friends? I I objectively would, yes. I don't think my partner would, but I would. You would live with friends. Oh, I would. I've I've actually talked about it with some friends before and and had like loose, vague, dreamy plans about it. Uh, One involved, so a thing you get a lot in LA, are houses that have like these like carriage houses or guest houses in the back. 
So there's like two houses technically on one property. And at one point, me and my partner were talking to my best friend about like a world where maybe we all went in on it together. Uh, I, I loved the idea personally. Alec, what do you think? Uh, I don't know if I'd buy a home with somebody else because that seems like a we like it seems like it go wrong so many ways. But I am pro living with roommates. Um, I mean, I don't right now. I live with my partner. Uh, I don't think I could get back in the habit of living with people, mostly for reasons of like uh, I've had disgusting roommates. I'm kind of disgusting. Uh, me and my partner, have, like we met a good balance. Like I'm, I'm fine for her to know my shame of how disgusting I am and for her to give me shit about it and vice versa. Um, I don't want to bring other people in there, but you know, before I was living for years and years, uh, one place with like three other roommates, you know, I, I lived in dorms, uh, in like a suite style and like those times were great. Like I was just living with my friends. Obviously there's issues about when your roommate takes the mop and decides to clean the toilet with it, because that's the thing normal people do. Jesus. Um, but I do find like, I think this happens to, uh, for, for, for all you slightly younger listeners in a couple of years, all your friends are going to like shack up with their boyfriend or girlfriend. Uh, and you're going to see them less and you're like, Oh, they live far away. It's hard to see each other. They're doing all this stuff. And I think living with other people can just solve a lot of those problems. And like, build, I, I think like people often do need a sense of community or support network or all those things. Um, I think my ideal situation is all my friends just move to my neighborhood, which I'm constantly mm -hmm. trying to convince them to. That's so Michael, Serby, move to Brooklyn. It's a great neighborhood. I would. That's I think Wisecrack should do a, a move to another city. Why Why are we in L.A.? Let's go. Well, that's Let's why go. I got to find Jared, a girlfriend in Brooklyn, and then he will uproot the whole company. I, I've been trying I'm not going to get years. into it. I feel like there's various reasons he would he would do better finding a girlfriend in New York, but I won't get into that right now. Um, <laughs> but, but I do think as well, maybe some Serbia's going to get into. I do think this is a, a kind of uniquely American phenomenon, the, the like living in such a, an, an isolated context. Um, I know, for example, like the... I lived in the UK for a while and there it's pretty normal uh, for people that aren't married well into their thirties or forties to like still live together. And not a lot of people live alone just because, and I even knew couples there that shared places. And I know in a lot of Europe and, and Latin America, it's pretty normal to like live at home with your family until you are married. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a, a kind of thing we, we do to ourselves uniquely in terms of social isolation in this way. Yeah, it is. And that was something that I thought was interesting was like the community aspect. So it's very common in Asian cultures for you to live at home or to live in multi-generational households. Um, so that wasn't foreign to me. But what I thought was interesting was the idea of living with friends. Like, see, that's the thing I couldn't I couldn't get around to. Like, I could see living with family and living with like. Oh, I'd way rather live with friends. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't. And even though like I like my mom and stuff, so I would like to live with her. But the idea of living with like my grandparents, I couldn't do it. Or living with like really just like a handful of family members I could live with. Um, but I think it's the fact of like buying property together I could do. I think that's that's what would make me hesitate. And I could see so many problems with that. Like what happens if you get in a fight or what happens if one of the couples breaks up or something mm -hmm. like wh what does the division of assets look like like things like that i wouldn't like to do is buying property and tying yourself financially to somebody else yeah yeah i'm like weird with money and by that i mean bad with money so that that wouldn't be a thing i would think about and i would be the one that would go into it with some logic of like okay so we'll pay the mortgage proportionally based on income everyone currently has so we're technically participating the same amount and blah 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 but like i know that wouldn't work and it would get messy uh but i don't know I, I i think if people weren't as weird about money it'd be easier and then you just have to sign a contract that says you can't break up with that person or if you break up with them you immediately have to have another partner that moves in and takes their slot yeah it's reasonable i mean i i, I think we will see a lot more of this though yeah. i mean it's already you mentioned the uk New York, similarly, like I know a lot of people in their 30s, 40s, I don't know how old this person, maybe 50, have roommates with or without partners. Um, and it's just because New York is so expensive, maybe the UK is also similar to that. And I think as there's like, as people keep moving into cities and there's like mm -hmm. less and less apartments and they get more expensive, you're gonna see it. But I think, I mean, I always complain that we live in tiny closets for too much money, but 
that is one upside is we'll have friends. Yeah, well, there's um, a new startup-y company that's sort of like we work for apartments. I think it's called Treehouse. Oh, or that's a dystopian like that. no- nightmare. Oh yeah, it's, it's hell. Um, and they they're opening one or just opened one in LA. And for anyone who hasn't heard of this, it's basically like a, a glorified college dorm for millennials that work in tech, where you have like a literal tiny room that's yours, shared living space, kitchen, bathroom, stuff like that. They plan communal activities, and the rent is a lot. It's like not cheap. I looked into it out of curiosity, and it's still very expensive. But it really is like living in a tech dystopian WeWork dorm environment. And I, I wonder if things like that aren't going to continue to rise in popularity, both as a way to sort of uh, vampirically suck as much money as possible out of this weird tech culture we live in, and also to respond to the housing crisis. Yeah, and I, those are, I think, extra shitty because this might sound cool, but like they provide all the cleaning for you, so there can never be fights about it. But as someone who lived in a dorm for a long time was an RA and had to deal with like shitty roommate disputes, people who do that are like unable, unable and unwilling to like grow up and fucking mop the floor. Uh, and it's just sort of enabling these horrible like tech bros who are like, whatever, like I just don't ever have to learn to do my own laundry. That's bad. I do know of a woman who lives in uh, like a group home scenario in the Bay Area. Um, so they all live in like apartments and then they also have a kitchen and a communal like living space downstairs. And she says it's great because she's like, rather than live at home, I get to live in this like larger community with people and I can have my own space, but then I can also go downstairs and eat dinner with a bunch of people if I want to. I I think that sounds nice. I, but I, once again, I like being around people, but I do. I still think back to Alex's point about living in the same neighborhood. I mean, that would be my dream that all my best friends live within walking distance distance of each other in the same neighborhood, and we can literally just meet up at our like local bar or coffee shop. I guess like as a mix between Friends and How I Met Your Mother, uh, or Seinfeld, and just have that like communal place. I think that would be really nice to to live in such a way that I could have my own space, but also know that I could have proximity to friends that I care about. And that's bracketing the money thing, of course. Yeah. Cool. Well, further thoughts on the Serbia? Or? Oh, no, that's it. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so let's, well, before we wrap up, let's do some emails. And as a reminder, we love to hear from you. Uh, if you think we just say that for shits and giggles, we don't. It's awesome. And especially any of these topics today, if, if you've been on a reality dating show, if you're currently on dating apps, and if you're thinking about buying a home with friends, we'd love to hear what you think about this or just anything else you think applies to the general realm of things we talk about. So please do hit us up at culturebinge at wisecrack.co. Remember, no M, culturebinge at wisecrack.co. Or, or call us at 1-213-534-8807. That is 1-213-534-8807. Leave us a voicemail. We'd love to hear from you and hear your voice. It's really fun. So do that. In the meantime, Alec, what have we heard from our delicious and wonderful fans this week? Well, the first one is from Jay. I guess last episode you were talking about purposely getting hit by a car for <laughs> financial yeah, yeah. Gr- grifting I, I want to do somebody. This. Yes. Yeah. So uh, here's Jay. Like everyone else, I'm a huge fan of all your work. Thanks, Jay. It's helped me keep my sanity through law school, which is a huge deal. Hell yeah. Awesome. Hell yeah. Speaking of that, that's actually why Jay is writing today. In the last episode, Michael mentioned that he had <laughs> he, had, he had given not entirely goofy thought to maybe getting hit by a car on purpose so that he could win a lot of money in a lawsuit and be more financially stable. Since I care about you guys and would like Culture Binge to continue, I just wanted to let Michael know that this would almost certainly not work out well. <laughs> Obviously, I'm a law student, so this is not legal advice. California follows what's called the comparative negligence theory. Put way too simply, this basically means that in accident situations, the party pay the respective responsibility for that accident. So in Michael's hypothetical, let's assume that a court found that Michael was 50% responsible for the accident while the driver was 50% responsible. To be honest, this seems optimistic for Michael. Let's further assume Michael suffers $100,000 in total damages, medical expenses, time off from wisecrack, et cetera. Under California law, the driver would only owe Michael $50,000, half of Michael's damages, because the driver was only half to blame for the accident. In this case, Michael would have lost $100,000, but only recouped $50,000. Shit. Uh, so don't do that. Okay, on to plan B. And thank you so much. That's awesome. These are the emails we, we love. Tell us why we're stupid with the knowledge that you have that we don't. That's incredible. Thank you so much. That was great, Jay. Thanks. 
Yeah, thank you, Jay. And good luck with the rest of law school. I hear that's tough, but that's yes. awesome. And, and you're going to crush it. Uh, let us know how it goes. Yes. <laughs> uh, the next one is an email from Ariel, who uh, uh, we were talking last week about organ donation. Ariel disagrees with me. Is that the right name? I think it is. Sorry if I miswrote your name. <laughs> Uh, so this is from uh, Ariel. I want to chime in on the organ donation issue, which is an extension of the freedom of self and body debate. The argument against organ donation for money, selling organs, let's call it by its name, is that for poor people, this may not be a choice at all, that they will be forced to sell a kidney to make ends meet. Sure, when you don't have money or about to get your house repossessed and live under crushing debt, it may seem like you don't have a choice but to sell a kidney. But actually, you do have a choice because nobody's forcing you to sell your kidney. You have something that is very valuable that can actually solve many of your problems. Opposing opposition to selling organs is actually the thing that denies people of this freedom. When you can't sell your kidney, then you really have no choice but to be crushed by said debt. Say you have a serious medical condition that you can't afford to treat. Sure, selling a kidney would add another medical condition, but otherwise you may just die of your first untreated one. Uh, another perspective that is ignored in this are the people who are sick who need the kidneys. Uh, opposing opposition to organ transplants for money to protect a person from health issues dooms another person to death from similar issues um i think well you go i respectfully disagree i mean there is a part to this that i understand there's obviously the people who need the kidneys it stimulates all that but go ahead i think you were gonna say something Michael was oh, not. Oh no! I, I I just also uh, I genuinely appreciate the thought of the response. I, I do respectfully disagree because I think there's still I, I think there still are levels of of societal uh, control or pressure that could go into that, and I think we just can't underestimate what someone could be while not like forced to do with a gun to their head, but forced to do due to financial constraints in terms of this sort of thing. And, and I think that it's, if anything, this email shows that it is a really complicated issue and we can't solve it in one podcast. We'll have to solve it in another episode, but I respectfully disagree, but appreciate the thought. Yeah. And I think, uh, and this isn't a way one over the other, but I think it asserts a narrow view of freedom, which is again, what I was saying before of, am I free without obstacles versus the freedom from, you know, extraneous forces, all that good stuff. Um, and I'm not saying one is worse than the other. Like, I think that's a really intense problem, right? Like I think there is the unfreedom of being coerced into doing something. And then the unfreedom of being told you can't do something. Um, I also have to say like when it comes to certain specific instances of people's houses being re repossessed and all that stuff, I would try to fix that stuff on its own. Like mm -hmm. there are large overarching problems and I don't think it's fair to take the most dystopian part of our society uh, and like be like, well, this awful solution will fix a tiny part of that. But here's uh, another email from Ross, same topic. Uh, I, unless, sorry, sorry. I, I, I do see, um, I do appreciate the email. I did agree with many points. Um, and I don't think that paying for organ donation is something that should be like completely off the table. I think maybe we should try to explore if there are ways to do it, but also protect people who are in vulnerable situations. Here, here. Uh, cool. So the next email, uh, same topic is from Ross. Hey, Wisecrack crew, listening to the newest culture binge where paying people to donate organs was a topic, and this had me worried on one big part. Uh, I say this is a guy signed up for organ, organ donation, that paying people for donating their organs is a very dangerous road. The big problem I see is almost all the people who don donate their organs for monetary exchange, whether it's ta cash, tax credits, or debt payments, will be poor people and those of the lower class, where an injection of 50K is life-changing. Uh, I agree with Alec that there is a potential for a class of people to exist where organ donations is all they are good for to upper-class people. Uh, I do think offering other s incentives, such as the vacation idea, is not bad as a kind of reward, but the idea is to raise awareness and get people signed up as or organ, organ do donators. Just my thoughts on something I could easily see going wrong and it being very hard to see going right, especially in America. Thanks, the cold Canadian Ross. Is this the same Ross who gave us layering advice? I hope so. Oh, I like him. Um, hopefully, another good take. Another good take on that. Uh, and I, 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 once again, I, I don't want to say I agree with Ross, because then he's, he's mostly agreeing with Alec, and I would be acknowledging that I think Alec says mm. smart things sometimes. So I'm going to be neutral on this. I think the part of the email that made me pause in my like mission to pay for organ donations is where he said something like, um, 
people might view this class as good for only organ donations and that like i could see that happening where That's like real. people could feel like oh like you're just an you're just an organ donor like what do you know like why don't you go give me your kidney and stop talking That's dark. i mean a similar thing has happened in that uh for a long time, and my specific context doing the research I've been doing is in vaccine, but I think it happened with a lot of pharmaceuticals, straight up testing them on orphans. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, it's good for the orphan's health. Maybe some of them like the vaccine, it might have been, you know, these are safety trials or efficacy trials. And uh, kids died. Not a, not a lot of kids, but too many kids. Uh, and no good. No good. they would just go to like the archdio the the bishop or whatever in charge of these Catholic orphanages. And so it's not great. It's not good. Let's, let's not do that anymore. Um, we don't do that anymore, I don't think. Hopefully not. Um, <laughs> we got any more emails, or is that, is that it for today's back? That's it. Okay, well, that is it for us. Um, thank you so much for sticking around. We love having you here. Like you said before, please call, please email. Um, Alec, if people need more of you in their lives, where can they find you? I don't know why they would, but uh, at Wisecrack Alec on Twitter, I tweet sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, Serby, people, if they want to find you not looking for gluten-free bread at Trader Joe's, where are you? Serby Patel 22 on Twitter. Oh, follow her. Uh, if you want to find me, I'm at Michael O'Burns on Twitter, and I think Michael O'Burns on Instagram as well. Thank you for sticking around. We'll be back in two weeks. And as always, if you like this, you will like our other podcast, our other shows. We have some new stuff popping these days. So uh, please subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just become obsessed with everything we do. And we'll be obsessed with you back in return. Uh, for Alec and Serby, I'm Michael. This has been Culture Binge, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.